Here is a piece of morally neutral denim. It doesn't know anything about the moral law and it couldn't do anything about it even if it did. So like the rock at the beginning of this series, it belongs firmly in the left hand side of our diagram. In section 1, we learned that neutral items such as this denim can be used for good or evil by moral agents like ourselves. We also learned that they can even be consecrated to God or Satan by spiritual agents like ourselves. But here's a question. What if morality doesn't come into it at all? What if someone, for example, just puts on this morally neutral denim and wears it to the mall? That is a completely neutral act, is it not? A bit like taking dishes out of the dishwasher or moving a sofa from one part of the room to another. No one is helped or harmed by it. It actually seems like a trivial question. In fact, a little bit weird. Why am I suddenly talking about wearing jeans to the mall? Who cares if someone wears denim to the mall? Well, let's make it a little more pertinent then. What if someone puts on this morally neutral denim and wears it to church? Still a little weird and trivial? I agree. But as bizarre as it may seem, and I'm a bit embarrassed to admit this, that's the kind of issue we Christians will often argue about the most. We'll argue about things like whether denim jeans are acceptable in church, or whether suits should be the only valid dress code for men, whether women are obliged to wear hats or keep their hair long. We'll argue about whether the pastor should be wearing a tie, or about what kind of musical instruments are valid during worship, about whether drums or guitars are godly enough. Others think drinking tea or coffee or water shouldn't be allowed in church. I've even heard that some people have argued about the type of flowers that are suitable in church. All these things are morally neutral. Hats, jeans, suits, ties, musical instruments, flowers, water and coffee. None of them are being used immorally and none of them are being consecrated to Satan. So why on earth are Christians arguing about such trivial, neutral things? What's going on here? The core of the issue is this. When Christians tackle moral questions, we are used to thinking in a very black and white way. There's a right way, a wrong way, and God defines the two. He's our reference point. Our job is simply to align ourselves with what he says. So when it comes to neutral issues, we tend to use the exact same mindset. We're looking to God for a reference point. We're asking, what does God say? What does he want? So the diagram changes like this. We extend the moral law out of the right-hand moral side and into neutral things as well, creating rights and wrongs about neutral things in the process. Basically, the idea is that God must have an opinion on everything, not just moral issues. He must have an opinion on hats and clothes and musical instruments too. And if he has an opinion on everything, that means that we can use him as a reference point for everything. Electric guitars must be fundamentally good or bad based on God's opinion of them. If God doesn't like them, then we shouldn't like them either, and we certainly shouldn't use them in church. If he doesn't like jeans, then we shouldn't wear them either. If he likes hats on women, then that's what women should wear. That's the thought process, that God must have preferences. Christians will therefore try to deduce what those preferences are, so that they can align themselves with them, even on neutral things. Now the problem here is that God doesn't actually say anything at all about jeans in the Bible and he's silent on the issue of whether you can drink water while you're listening to a sermon. He hasn't left us with a complete list of musical instruments that he finds acceptable in worship either. In the absence of clear guidance on these neutral issues, what tends to happen is the individual person will pass off their own preferences as being God-ordained. The subconscious thought process roughly goes along the lines of I don't like the music too loud in church and because I don't like it, I can't conceive how God could possibly like it either, so therefore loud music is wrong. Or I think the pastor looks scruffy without a suit. God would like the pastor to be smartly dressed, just as I do. I just can't see how God would approve of a scruffy pastor, so God must be on my side about this. We can't conceive that God may like something that we don't and so begin to feel like we can speak for God with some authority on such matters when actually we are only speaking for an idol in our minds who looks like us, talks like us, and thinks like us. We can easily imagine two guys who attend a church. One likes to wear jeans and the other likes to wear a suit. The man who wears a suit thinks God would want people to wear their best clothes in church out of respect for him, and to be fair, his conclusion makes sense. So believing he speaks for God on the issue, he demands that everyone else wear suits just like he does. 
On the other hand, the man who wears jeans to church believes that God doesn't care about outward appearances and is more concerned with the condition of our hearts, and God doesn't need our airs and graces either. And you can see his point as well. So believing that he speaks for God in the issue, he demands that everyone else wear casual clothes just like he does. Both are fundamentally attempting to please God with what they wear. Both are trying to use him as their reference point, but both have come to completely different conclusions. It's not a moral issue. Neither of them are inciting lust or doing anything immoral with what they wear. They're both just drawing a line in the neutral sand and asking themselves the question, what would God want? What side is he on? Does he like suits or jeans best? And then aligning themselves with what they perceive to be the answer. The suit wearer comes to his opinion and looks down on the jeans wearer for getting the wrong answer. And the jeans wearer comes to his opinion and looks down on the suit wearer for getting the wrong answer. Both sides are convinced that their stance on this neutral issue is the right one. And with both believing God to be on their side, you can see how it can lead to petty squabbles. Whenever people create laws on neutral issues like this, it's called legalism. There's a lot of it in churches around the world, and in its own way, it's just as big a mistake as licenses. Where the satanic law of license errs by saying that there are no laws, not even a moral one, and therefore you can do whatever you want, religious legalism is this error of going to the other extreme by creating mountains of laws on neutral issues and then insisting people must observe them to stay right with God. Legalism says that you better eat the right things and drink the right things and dress the right way and sing the right way and if you don't observe all the rules then you're probably going to be the subject of some serious gossip in church, some cold shoulders and disapproving glares and God probably hates you. In reality these laws are often simply derived from tradition or the personal preference of individuals rather than the Bible. Legalism renders Christianity nothing more than a system of prohibitions, a list of strict thou shalt and thou shalt not about what you can wear or eat or drink or do. So legalistic churches carry a forbidding, oppressive and gloomy air and are characterised by squabbles over petty and trivial things such as jeans and suits. They are cold, critical and unloving places where pride is rife due to the fact that everyone has constructed an idolatrous version of God in their heads who agrees with everything they say. This has been many a Christian's experience of church and what tends to happen, especially with the younger generations who grow up feeling suffocated by legalism, is that it drives them away from God. The do-what-you-want lawless license of Satanism looks extra attractive to those who have felt restricted by churchy legalism their whole lives. When you've been told, thou shalt not about everything, do what thou wilt, suddenly sounds like liberation. Therefore, it is fairly typical for young adults in their teens and twenties to abandon church, rebel against God and get involved in hard partying, sexual promiscuity, alcohol abuse and more. This phenomenon is partly responsible for the hemorrhaging of young people that the Western Church is currently experiencing. Fuller Youth Institute conducted a survey in 2011 that stated that 40 to 50 percent of young Christians in the USA fail to stick with their faith after high school. Now this statistic can't be entirely blamed on legalism and is indicative of a wider problem, but when quizzed about the findings, Cara Powell, executive director of FYI, said, the students involved in our research definitely tended to view the gospel as a list of do's and do nots, a list of behaviours. We asked our students, how would you define what it really means to be a Christian? And one out of three didn't mention Jesus Christ in their answer. They mentioned behaviours. When Christianity is seen as a list of rules rather than a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, we're in trouble. In fact, what we're really looking at is a church that has not understood the gospel message. That's a shocking thing to consider. The core message of liberty preached by Jesus upon which Christianity is founded is not understood by its own proponents. Somewhere along the line we have replaced it with a religious system of mere legalistic prohibitions and it's laying waste to large sections of the church. Today millions of young people are deserting this system, turning their back on the God whom they mistakenly believe it belongs to and are choosing instead to walk right into the arms of Satan. The age-old lie that Satan used to deceive Adam and Eve, that God is nothing more than an oppressive tyrant, sounds all the more believable to those who have a legalistic background. Doesn't it sound tyrannical when you are threatened with hell for wearing jeans in church or playing sport on a Sunday? Churches like this do Satan's work for him. 
Obviously, this is a big problem that must be addressed, not just for the sake of those young Christians who are being lost to Satan's lies, and not just so that the church can learn to live in freedom, but because unless the church gets its act together on this, it can't be salt or light to anyone else. A free society needs a free and healthy church because, as we learned, the church is its moral pioneer and moral guardian. We are the ones who are commissioned to bring the gospel to the world, but if we have no concept of the gospel ourselves, then how can we offer it to anyone? If the church is merely trying to combat satanic license with its own brand of legalism, even if it succeeds, it's only going to persuade the world to exchange one brand of bondage for another. This second section then is a study of the gospel. I say that as a kind of warning because many people will think that sounds too basic. There's also going to be a lot of talk about laws, which isn't the most exciting topic at the best of times. Non-Christians may struggle to see the relevance of what we're going to cover, things like temples and sheep and guys from the Middle East with beards. But since the research shows that we don't know our own message, this is something we have to do. In this section, we're going to explore exactly what Christian freedom looks like and why it's better than both satanic licentiousness and church illegalism. Mainly we have to do this because the shocking truth for the church today is that we don't realise just how free we are.